Okay, first of all, can everyone hear me? All right, yeah, cool, excellent. Um, thank you for attending this um, first of the, the series of four talks, and I hope you enjoy what I'm about to, to tell you. So today I'm going to take you through a journey that I began 30 years ago, and I can't believe that it's been that long already, um, investigating the ecology of little penguins. And the initial research was headed up by Professors Ron Muller and Stuart Bradley at Murdoch University, and I'm affiliated with both Murdoch University and Uni of Western Australia, so that's why both of those uh, banners are there. Um, and the, the projects have involved uh, several postgraduate students, many, many, many volunteers that I cannot thank enough, and, um, and myself, of course. And so today I'm gonna to just take you through some of the information that we've learnt from the little penguins, and I hope you find them um, at the end of this as fascinating as I do, and indeed understand that penguins do fly, it's just that it's underwater. So they are birds. <laughs> Okay, why is this happening? No, don't tell me it's not working. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Okay. So um, I'm going to give, um, a, it's going to be a very fast but convoluted uh, story, unfortunately, today about penguin ecology. I'm going to be telling you about their breeding, their diet, their habitat use and the threats. I'll give you an insight into some more recent research that I've been involved in, and then how we actually can use this to hopefully manage these penguins into perpetuity into the future at least. So generally um, speaking, I'm just now, the next few slides are gonna be on the general biology of little penguins wherever they are found. And we do know that penguins are found on the southern coast of Australia and in New Zealand. And on the southern coast of Australia, they're mainly found on offshore islands. So little penguins are about 30 to 40 centimetres in stature. They weigh about as much as a litre of milk, so 1,000 to 1,500 grams. Males are larger than the females, and they've got a male... Oh, I've got that one. No, I'm telling you all of my talk. <laughs> back, back. <laughs> Here we go. Um, Males here are larger than the females, so the males are slightly heavier and they've also got a bigger beak. So we can actually tell males from females by the size of their beak. They have a very high site fidelity to their colony. So they'll actually return to the colony that they left from as a chick. And they've got a high site fidelity to their nest site as well. And they do have a pretty high fidelity to their partners, but they do have this 40% divorce rate. And the reason why they, and we call it that, that's exactly a scientific term, is a divorce rate. And why they have a divorce rate is one, um, if obviously if a partner doesn't return, usually means that the partner has died uh, from the previous breeding year. But if they've also not been that successful at breeding, then they'll actually try and change their mates and try to get a better outcome with another mate. So penguins lay two eggs. Very rarely will they lay one egg and they will never lay more than two. Both parents, though, share the incubation process, and the incubation takes five weeks before those chicks hatch. And on average, we think that the penguins, uh, or we know from Phillip Island at least, that the penguins spend about three to five days incubating eggs before they actually then swap with their partner. So the partner that's been staying on the eggs doesn't eat for those, those days, and when the partner, other partner returns, it doesn't feed that penguin that's been sitting on the eggs. So they share that incubation. And then once the chicks have been hatched, they require looking after for about two weeks. So you can see here, we've got two chicks here. These chicks are about a week and a half old, and they're not able to maintain their own warmth, nor are they able to maintain um, vigilance against predators. So basically they need a parent there to actually try and uh, look after them. And I can attest when I try to get a penguin out from a box or a burrow, they bite. They are not nice and sweet and cute and cuddly. They bite and they hurt. And um, so I think their penguin parents are very good against lots of predators. Now, once the penguin chicks get bigger, they're very hungry and both parents now need to go out to sea to feed. So the both parents will go out in the morning, they'll come home at night and then they'll feed the chicks. And once the chicks are about eight weeks old, they're totally fledged and they go to sea. So this little penguin here is about seven weeks old. You can see it's got lots of its, um, or some of its down and you can see all these emerging blue feathers. 
So they really are this blue penguin, which they often caught in New Zealand. But the most pivotal thing that an adult penguin has to do in its year is to actually molt, because the feathers get worn as they swim through the water throughout the year. And so they're not as energetically um, hydrodynamic as the, as the feathers get worn. So the first thing that they must do, or the most important thing that they must do in a year is molt. And this is a very energetic, expensive process. It takes a couple of weeks and they can't go to sea to feed while they're actually molting. It takes about two weeks for the feathers to, the old feathers to be pushed out by the new feathers. And because they can't go to sea to feed, they've actually got to dig up all this stuff before they can go out to the, to, um, before they start molting. Uh, so they actually get quite fat. And you can see them waddling along. Penguins waddle anyway, you know that. But these guys get really a lot of fat in their hips. Um, and uh, then the, the feathers, uh, the feathers start to swell up as well. So they go through this pre molt hatching phase. It takes about two weeks for them to build up all of this fat. And then they sit in their um, boxes, like you can see here, or in um, under caves, under rocks, um, and they lose their feathers. So this bird here has lost about a quarter of its feathers. This one's got a few just final remaining feathers on its flippers. And this one's finished molting. But it's just takes a couple of days to the water feed. So what they actually have is a gland at the base of their tail that produces oil, and the birds get the, um, the oil on their beak, and then they put that all over their feathers. And that takes another couple of days before they can then go out to see the um, feed. So more of their general biology. They forage at sea during the day, and that was part of my PhD was to actually look at the light levels that penguins require to catch fish. So um, once the light starts to dim, they can't go, they can't see the fish uh, anymore, and so then they have to start heading back for home. So they forage at sea during the day, and then at night time, uh, they generally land in groups of three or more. And this is a safety thing, it's, it's an avoidance of predators, because you imagine you're coming up the beach by yourself and there's a sea lion sitting on the beach, and you're going to have quite a high chance of actually getting caught. But if you've got a group of friends around you, then you've got your, your chances of getting caught in the less. So they generally come up, and they come up about three, uh, between from dusk to three to four hours after dusk. And how long it takes for them to return depends on how far they were away and they were feeding. Now, some penguins will stay at sea overnight. And, um, but again, if a, if a penguin spends eight hours bobbing on the surface of sea, then they're actually going to have a high uh, risk of being taken by a predator. So they have what we call a polyphasic sleep. And they actually only sleep for about three or four minutes at a time. So penguins can stay out at sea for much time and then sleep for about three or four minutes and then start doing anything else that they need to do. And then they'll repeat that throughout the day and through the night. So in Perth, we have three colonies, um, Penguin Island, Garden Island and Karnak Island. And then the next closest colonies are down in the southwest, down near Albany, here, and then in um, on the soft, small islands of the region in Caledonia. Now, little penguins on Penguin Island have the highest conservation status of all major little penguin colonies in Australia. And this was based on a few features that I will talk about later in the, in the talk. So our little penguin studies on Penguin Island have been have Penguin Island have been going since 1986. So we've got a 30-odd year um, data set, which is absolutely phenomenal. And we put um, monitoring nest boxes out on the island in 1986. So that's these kind of nest boxes. On Penguin Island, the sand is too shallow for the penguins to actually dig burrows. So uh, when they nest under natural bushes, like these ones under here, under buildings and in the caves, but it makes it very hard to actually monitor the penguins when you're trying to scramble through bushes or under under um, under buildings to try to look at them. So we put out these nest boxes, or not me, but another student in 1986, and luckily lots of penguins took to those nest boxes quite quickly. And so those nest boxes have been um, monitored almost every two weeks since that time. And over time we've put out more nest boxes, so we actually have about 140 nest or 130 nest boxes out there at the moment. So we look at those uh, when when they're laying their eggs. We look at the number of eggs laid. You know that it's usually one, um, usually two, but sometimes one. 
we look at the percent of those eggs that hatch and then the percent of those um, that turn into fledglings. We've also looked at dive analyses and we've done that over eight, oh, in fact, more than eight different years now, but um, using it as several techniques. So looking at what the penguins are feeding on and uh, habitat use, so looking at um, where penguins are actually foraging using radio tracking devices. Thank goodness not anymore because that's a really a lot of hard work using radio tracking devices, but satellite tags and also GPS tags. And even now we have 3D tags. So what have we, what have we learned from all of these years of all these different studies? So penguin islands. Penguins here breed any time from April through to November. So it's a, it's a long uh, breeding period and it's one of the reasons why they've been given the highest conservation status. They can lay up to two clutches and they can actually raise two, two clutches in a year if it's a good year and there's lots of food um, Peak of egg lay is normally June to June and September, but that also varies from year to year. That's what our long-term monitoring is suggesting that it can be sometimes, they can might sometimes have a single peak in July, they can sometimes have a single peak in September, sometimes they have two peaks, it just varies. And these birds molt from December to February. Now, unfortunately for penguins on Penguin Island, molting occurs when it's the highest temperatures. We've got our summer, summer temperatures, and as I said, they get that from their fat, so they're already hot, because they, they've got all this fat on them and producing feathers is a very energetic and, and exothermic, so it produces a lot of heat. So they're already hot and unfortunately they're, happening, they're molting at the time of the year when it's very hot and they've also got to contend with the highest number of visitors on the island. Now after molt, they leave for about three months, but we have no idea where they go. Um, unfortunately, the tags aren't small enough to leave on the people amount this this time we think but we really don't know now on a daily basis they leave before dawn um, sometimes as early as two or three o'clock in the morning and I've heard that some of people who've been living on the island see um, occasionally see like a leaf penguin that goes around to all the other nests and says you know, all of them they sort of all get out together and then they return um, up to three to four hours after dusk as I said earlier so what do penguins eat and how have we done this? I'm going to talk about a few different um, methodologies that we've used to actually work out what penguins eat. Now, see, a lot of birds uh, will actually feed their young by the young, sticking their head into the parent's mouth and then the parents will build it. So we use that principle for penguins, but what we do is we stick a tube on the penguin's throat and we put warm saline water into the um, into their tummies and then we tip the birds upside down and they vomit into a bucket. And that's not such a nice thing to do to a penguin. It really isn't. Um, and it means that we can only do that on an, one adult, um, oh sorry, on an adult, and we would only do it like once, um, probably every three or four months because we, we would have the ideas of the adult and so we wouldn't do it again and again. And we would feed up the adult before we let it go but it's not such a nice thing to do. But in our bucket, so we find um, sometimes whole fish, but more often it's a mess. It's an absolute mush of a whole range of things. But what we're looking for in particular are these otoliths, which are the ear bones of fish. And every fish species has a different shape otolith. And then as the fish grows, the otolith grows as well. So we can actually work out the size of the fish that the penguins are feeding on based on the size of the otolith. But as I said, it's not such a nice um, and it's a lot of work catching penguins and putting them upside down and making them regurgitate. So we've also been doing some DNA analysis of some species. Now, um, normally when you pick up a penguin, they often poo on you. So, you know, I'll be seen sort of scraping poo off my, my pants and things. But I've got a student here who's got a little sample pot based at the butt of his little penguin jig, um, trying to wait for it to poo. Often what we will do is put them into, the, particularly the chicks, put them into a bucket with um, a warm um, hot water bottle and just wait for them to do it. Uh, so we do the DNA analysis of feces. Now the good thing about this is that we've got it, we get a really big um, range of fish that the penguins are feeding, or prey that the penguins are feeding on. The bad thing is that we cannot get this fish like we can get with the oceans. And we also do stable isotopes. What the penguins are feeding 
when they were growing those feathers. So for the adults, it's when they were molting, and then for the chicks, it's when they were growing the feathers, those young chicks. We can also do stabilised prep in blood, which is about what the pigs are feeding on three or four days prior to that. So what do we know? So from the, and this data here is uh, from the regurgitant analysis. So we know that they were mainly feeding on white bait, blue sprats, oh, so white bait here, blue sprats, anchovy, garfish, and pilchards. And we know that they were mainly feeding on the white bait while they were raising chicks, and that the white bait were around three to nine or 30 to 90 mil, but an average size was 40 to 50. Now, what about where did the fish come from? So there were some scientists from Murdoch University who looked at uh, several sites, caught, caught fish at several sites along 55 kilometres of the coastline, going from, uh, going from Mandra and then up as past uh, Fremantle. And what they found was that there was higher proportions uh, this is white bait and blue sprat here. White bait at this what was called the marina site, but also high proportions down here in the Mandra and also um, in Northern Comet Bay. And these were the small fish, the, the 20 to 30 mil. So this is the juvenile white bait. These are white bait nurse fish. And that the larger fish, the 40 to 100 mil white bait, so the main, main size that the penguins were feeding on, were found offshore in Comet Bay. So we'll come back to this about the marina later, but just re remember that we've got high numbers of, of white bait at, these marine, at this marina site. So some other researchers back in late 2000, uh, sorry, early 2000s, got penguin, um, penguin bat samples and they also got fish samples from, from the majority of, ah, oh, <laughs> this is not playing the game, from the majority of these sites as well. And then the sites that are in red are the ones that they did statistical analyses on. So what they found, what they were looking at is a ratio of oxygen and carbon in the ovaries, so in these ear bones. And they're a bit like tree rings, so that as the fish grows, it lays down another ring of, of bone in the, um, in the ears and uh, in the ear bones. And they have different, every one of those rings has a different ratio of carbon and oxygen. And that gives you some information about where the fish spent that part of its life. So what they found is that these ratios of carbon and oxygen were very specific to sites, and that the fish that the penguins were feeding on came from that Betcha Point site. So from that site that has the largest white bait nursing area in amongst this um, coastal area. Right, so we know what penguins feed on. We know when they breed and we know where the fish are coming from, but how about where are the penguins feeding? So how do we do that? So for several years now, I've been attaching satellite tags here during incubation, and then GPS tags, and now more recently 3D tags during the uh, phase when they're guarding the chicks. The beauty with the satellite tags is that unlike when I was radio tracking and I had people set up at towers and listening for beeps of penguins, I can actually see where a penguin is almost in real time. The problem with the GPS and the satellite tags is that I can't see it in, on my computer, but I have to wait to get the tag back to be able to see that data. But the good thing about the GPS tags and the 3D tags is it gives me much greater um, and finer scale of movement of the penguins. So it's with the satellite tag, there's um, a location probably every two hours, with the GPS and the 3D tags, But they are data hungry and data safety hungry, which means that they would actually not last very long. So, and everyone always asks, how do you attach a tag to a penguin? So this is how we wrap them up in a little burrito. <laughs> this is a horse's tag we, we fashion for, for little penguins. Um, so I sit the penguin in this cuff, and then I just uh, with a hairdresser's comb, in fact, lift up a layer of feathers, put a layer of tape, a special tape that you get from Germany called Tessa tape. Um, you put that under a layer of feathers and then you do the next layer and the next layer and the next layer. You then put your tag over the top and then you overlay a bit like a celery salad, basically. Um, layer the, the tape over the top so that it's touched on each, each piece of tape. And the, the, the tape becomes very strong when it's overlaid on each one. 
itself. It's a bit like Velcro. And using this method, I can actually get a good 20 days for a satellite tag to remain on a penguin. Um, I can now get more days big, uh, by putting on a cable tie and then just putting a touch of glue on. And you want to try to get these back because they're expensive. Satellite tags are $1,500 each. The GPS tags are around $800 each. So they're expensive and you do lose them. You do expect to lose some, but you don't want to lose too many. And so this is what we found from the satellite tagging. So in fact, when I first put a satellite tag on, the, on a penguin in 2007, I thought somebody had grabbed a penguin and put it on a boat because I did not think that penguins were very good to find that. So, um, and then we find this very consistently year after year. So we've got penguins going into Coburn Sound from Penguin Island, but heading down to uh, past, Geogra uh, past Bunbury to Geograph Bay and even as far south as um, Bunbury is a very favoured spot for penguins and this has been consistent across all the years that I've done um, this tracking. Ba uh, Binning up is, is important, Lake Preston area uh, and Coburn Sound. Now the interesting thing that I've found is that where penguins are nesting on the island depends on, show, um, really uh, determines which way they're going to go. So for those penguins that are on the northeast side of the island, they head north up into Coburn Sound. And if anyone knows Coburn Sound, you know that there's a causeway that goes across the Garden Island. They don't go under that causeway. They go along the west side of the Garden Island, up around the top and down into the Coburn Sound. And for those people that are on the west and the south on the island, they head south. Oh, sorry, but the, the problem with this though, is that instead of the three to five day incubation period that I said that a lot of penguins have, they're actually sitting at sea or incubating um, for 10 or more days. And in fact, I've had a penguin sitting on eggs for 20 days while her partner was at sea for 20 days. So it takes a long time. It takes about two or three days for a penguin to travel this far south. And then they're spending days and days and days in this area and then they're heading back to their, um, to their partner. That means that the partner sitting at home is not feeding, is likely to potentially abandon eggs. They can actually go out for a day, leave the eggs for a day or so, and then come back. But we've got a higher rate of abandonment when we're when the penguins are spending a long time in this kind of southern area. But this also shows us that Bunbury is a very important area for the penguins, as is spinning up, as I said, Lake Preston. And so potential impacts can occur for these penguins anywhere along those areas. Okay, so but what happens when they're guarding chicks? When they're guarding chicks, they can't stay out for 20 days. They've got to come back and feed those chicks every night. So if I can get this, but this is a tag uh, or movement of a penguin with a GPS tag on it. And it then spends about oh, six hours or so right in the city from Golden Bay area. And then headed home. So they can do maybe a two day trip at the most, but that means if they do that, that the chicks are not being fed. So they have to stay nice and close. In fact, they have to stay within 30 kilometers of the island. You never get penguins on Penguin Island heading out west. Um, and as I said, those that are on the south will head south. Those that are on the north head up to the west side of Garden Island. So they don't go into Coburn Sound. They don't have enough time to go into Coburn Sound. Now the 3D tags that we're now using are really exciting because this gives us information about the um, depths that the penguins are using when they're chasing fish and it gives us information exactly where they are chasing the fish as well. So you can see here we've got three different types or uh, two types of dives and some surface types. So we've got what we call a W-shaped dive and this is where the penguins are obviously bouncing around and um, they're finding fish and they're going up and down in the water column. Then we've got some time that the bird spends on the surface surface, we'll come back to that. And then we have what we call search dives. So these are the typical V-shaped dives, the bird goes down, looks for some fish, can't find anything, comes back up. Now, penguins can dive up to 150 times an hour. So they're out there, they're working hard, they're doing a lot of energy, uh, a lot of expen expenditure of energy, working really hard, but how often they um, dive will depend on how deep they're diving as well. So some birds tend to be more shallow divers, diving in the top four to five metres, um, and others are diving the full depth of the um, the pinna tree in, in Coburn Sound and Comet Bay down to 16, 20 metres. 
But not only do we know what, when the penguins are feeding, we can work out um, how much energy they're using and what they're doing in that space. So the group of beads here are in the black, and we've got um, the pitch, or so whether the penguin's heading down or up in the red, and the blue is actually whether they're rolling. So um, we, we can find out that the penguins are uh, beating their flippers as they're going down in the water column, and that's because they've got to overcome buoyancy, and then they don't, they don't beat their flippers as they're coming up, as they're ascending, because the, the buoyancy just brings them back up to the surface. And we can start to actually look at um, the energy that they're using at different times of the day and in different um, depths of water as well. So knowing all of this information, knowing when they're feeding, where they're feeding, what they're feeding on, when they're breeding, when they're traveling, all of this information that now starts, for, um, starts to give a picture on what the penguins are threatened by and what um, the different potential threats mean. So for instance, a reduction of food availability. Now, if you've got limited food, you're not gonna have enough food to feed your chicks, so your chicks are potentially going to starve. If you've got limited food at the beginning of breeding, you don't have enough body condition to actually start to get to move into breeding. And so penguins will not even um, move into that breeding phase because it's more important for them to survive, which means that they probably have to go somewhere else and try to find food for an extended period of time. If you've got less food and your chicks aren't as, as fat, then they're more likely to die as well because penguin chicks um, have a much higher survival rate if they're a very good size when they leave the, the nest. For part of my PhD, I actually looked at how little penguin chicks or juveniles did when they, uh, before they'd been to see it, how, how they did at catching fish. And they're really bad at catching fish, first up. They try to um, eat leaves, eat bubbles, eat bits of sand. Um, they don't know anything about their buoyancy when they first hop in the pool and so they, or hop in the water. And so they're actually overshooting the, the, boy, the, um, the surface of the water. And it takes them a while to learn those skills. And so the fact that they are at the beginning, the better the chance they are of surviving because then they can make all these misses of catching fish and other prey or take, totally take the wrong thing. And then they can, they can wear that through. So it's really important that they have that, those, um, that food availability. Now, if you're a bit squeamish, you might not want to look at the next couple of, um, of slides, but we do find that penguins um, interact, unfortunately, with watercraft of all manner and forms. And so we get collisions. So unfortunately, this penguin's lost its foot. And this one has got a subcutaneous um, cut right through to its muscle. And that is very typical of patella. Wounds. But we also get um, broken bones, subcutaneous bruising, so we don't see anything on the, extern on the exterior of the penguin. So it's been hit by blunt force trauma, so by a jet ski or by perhaps a kite surf or something. But the other thing, as I said, is um, we, you might recall from that diving, uh, that 3D diving graph, that penguins spend time on the surface. And that surface time is very important for them to, to re um, to reduce the lactic acid in their muscles and to get the oxygen into their uh, bodies, but it also allows them to digest the food. And what we know is that penguins who are feeding chicks catch food for themselves in the morning, and then they digest all of that, and then they're catching food for the chicks in the afternoon. So they need that important time on the surface, and they spend longer on the surface in the afternoon than in the morning. But boats, watercraft, all sorts of craft can actually interrupt that time that they're on the surface. And this happened last year when I was on Penguin Island. And so this is all um, jet skis that are coming through the area, uh, not being idiots, um, but just traveling through the area. And so penguins don't know one where to come up when, there's, when you've got jet skis like this, but even if you've got one jet, jet ski, they're often quite erratic. So penguins don't know where to come up um, to, to breathe. But then you've also got that interruption of the time on the surface. So any watercraft activity can and will interrupt penguins resting on the surface. And then we get birds entangled in, in fishing gear um, and plastic pollution. So this here is a penguin that was um, caught by fishing line to a book, uh, and sending it back out to sea. This one looks like it swallowed the hook, but the fishing line got caught in the, on some twigs, and again, it couldn't get out. So if you're out there fishing, make sure you try and take your line with you. 
But other threats, penguins are exposed to are oil spills. Uh, there was a big oil spill off Tasmania a few, quite a few years ago, and they tried to translocate penguins, but as I said, penguins have a very high flight fidelity. So even though they were taken away, they just swam back and swam through the oil again. So even small oil spills can actually impact penguins. It impacts the, uh, the waterproofing on their feathers and obviously makes them exposed to cold. And then 